So uh, this uh, is the title that I was assigned. <laughs> and for those of you who brought your bells, put them away. I thought the support study was a randomized trial to improve the use of advanced care directives in patients in intensive care units. <laughs> so I'm a full-time employee of PCORI. Our mission is to do comparative effectiveness research, uh, but I'm not here as a representative of PCORI. My bosses have not looked at these slides. This is strictly uh, my opinion. Uh, cryptic randomness, I'm uh, assuming, means randomness that the patient doesn't know about. And the standard of care research is basically uh, comparative effectiveness research. Now, I uh, took the liberty of uh, editing uh, the title a little bit. And what I'm really, I think, going to talk about is cryptic randomness in standard, in standard care. Now, when a, when a patient chooses a doctor, they want to know where they're going to get the care that reflects the evidence or at least a consensus of opinion about what's best. And they also want to know that they're going to get the, the care that's best for them. Most of the time, they won't have uh, much advance notice about the doctor's practice style. And in fact, I will argue that choosing a doctor has a strong element of chance. So. Now, let's put ourselves in the shoes of a patient. Suppose that you checked your blood pressure at the local drugstore and you found that it was elevated. You're new to the area, so you pick a primary care doctor's name out of the phone book and make an appointment. Now it's the day of your appointment and you walk up the sidewalk uh, to the doctor's office and the doctor has a sign in front. The doctor is in. Well, that's a start. And, uh, and he uses a tenolol for high blood pressure. A tenolol is a beta blocker in common use uh, for high blood pressure as an initial treatment. Your reaction? That's nice. I know what I'm getting in for. If I'm allergic to a tenolol, maybe I'll turn around and go back and find another doctor. But I'm informed. Now suppose that you picked another primary care physician's name out of the phone book. Again, you approach her office, and here's the sign. The doctor is in. Good. That's nice. I wonder what kind of treatment she likes to give. From your perspective, as a new patient, never seen the, the doctor before, the treatment you get would be random. You're, you don't know what you're getting into. And you would not know what the doctor treatment the doctor will choose. So here's a third scenario, same as the others, uh, but another doctor. Here, the sign says the doctor is in. She practices shared decision making. No problem. I'll get the treatment that best fits me and my preferences. So what's the message of these three scenarios? Um, I'll argue that from the patient's perspective, the care received would seem random to the patient if the patient didn't know the physician's routine. The, fa the physician might use um, any treatment, perhaps picking it on the basis of whether it's a cloudy or a sunny day, and that would be pretty much truly random treatment. More likely, the physician uh, had a routine. They used one treatment consistently, uh, and regardless of the patient's features, that's the one they use. This would be random, from the patient's perspective, but also, and this is important, bias prone. So care would not seem random if the physician explained his routine. I always used a tenolol. And it would not seem random if the patient incurred shared decision making. So again, how could standard care appear random to the patient? Uh, two examples that we might want to think about are early stage breast cancer, simple mastectomy versus lumpectomy and radiation, and initial therapy of hypertension, uh, where the All Hat study showed three different treatments to be more or less equivalent. So one mechanism for random, with the patient would literally toss a coin to decide on treatment, but more likely they would have a routine that the patient doesn't know about. So 
routines are bias prone, and so a big part of this talk is going to be to ask, do routines happen? Because if they do, there's potential for randomness and, uh, and, and bias. So we're gonna go through three uh, sources of evidence that patients, uh, physicians have treatment routines. And I'll, I'll start with the bottom line is that the evidence is pretty weak, uh, but suggestive. Uh, I'm gonna talk first about small area variation, then I'm going to talk briefly about instrumental variable analysis, cutting out a lot of slides in order to stay within Dr. Hyman's uh, time limit. And finally, physician-specific cohort, where you actually know what the physician chooses in a series of patients. So, patterns of care by individual physicians, that's my theme, small area variation. Practically everybody in this room has seen one of these before, and it shows uh, the different hospital referral areas in the United States, and the intensity of care for the darkest red uh, in the average the average cost per year for a Medicare enrollee is 8,200, and the lightest uh, yellow is uh, the average cares cost 52,300 roughly. Um, so big variations in the amount of care. And the question is, does this indicate that physicians have routines? Well, a uh, small area variation means that doctors in one area treat more intensively uh, than doctors in another area. But uh, the data are all at the geographic unit level, an average figure within the hospital referral area. We do not have individual level data, and therefore we don't know about the distribution of utilization by doctors within a region and be able to compare those distributions. At, for instance, here we have practice intensity uh, along the abscissa, and the ordin is the number of physicians. And the bell-shaped curve might represent a reasonable uh, variation around an agreed-upon standard of care. Uh, the uh, yellow uh, bar might indicate a place where everybody learned from the same master physician and they all practice exactly the same way. And the red line would indicate uh, basically skewness uh, toward greater practice intensity in a particular hospital referral area. So, um, is small area variation in care intensity evidence that doctors have routine? Well, we can certainly infer that the distribution of intensity is skewed toward higher utilization in the more intense regions of the United States. So some physicians' uh, practice must be skewed toward high intensity. There's probably differences uh, between them and many of the others. We don't know how consistent high users are uh, in following their routine. And from the patient's perspective, Skewness means that the care they will receive, while random, when they first walk up to the doctor's office, uh, may also be biased toward more or less intense options. In other words, they're more likely to get one treatment than the other, and they don't, they don't really know about it. They're uninformed. So uh, patterns of care by individual physicians. Um, this is going to take too long for the time we've got, so I'm going to try to skip to the bottom line. So basically, an instrument is an external cause of the exposure to the treatment, but it's not directly uh, result, uh, related to the outcome. The perfect instrument is randomization. It affects the treatment directly, but it has no relation to the outcome except as manifest through the treatment. So uh, why might instrumental variables which create uh, random or semi-random collections of patients that uh, may be equivalent divided by the existence of the instrumental variable, why would that help us to understand randomness of care? Well, as I said, an instrumental variable can divide a population randomly 
into two similar subpopulations. When two similar subpopulations get different care, I'd argue that routines are overriding consideration of the patient's uh, clinical characteristics. So uh, skipping to the bottom line of this study, the prevalence of risk factors for bad outcomes uh, in, the in, uh, in the index patients were the same in, uh, for, for patients of people who prescribed atypical antipsychotic medication and physicians who uh, uh, prescribed conventional antipsychotic uh, medication. There are risk factors for good outcomes with these two different treatments. Uh, and what we found, or what the authors found, is that the risk factors, the prevalence of risk factors seem to be the same uh, in uh, two groups of patients based on the previous uh, pay, uh, pay, uh, choice of therapy uh, from the pre uh, most recent patient. So physician uh, treatment preference, the instrumental variable, were not associated with patient characteristics, which makes me think that physicians appeared to stay with their preference, conventional or atypical drug, irrespective of the patient's characteristics, which I would argue is evidence for prescribing routines. So now let's go to physician-specific cohorts, getting close to the end. Um, so what have we learned so far? Small area variation, I think the evidence is suggestive that physicians have routines, uh, but it's indirect. Uh, the same basically is true for the instrumental variable approach. But if we could analyze physician-specific cohorts, we could actually see what a given physician prescribes of, let's say, th between three different uh, drugs for uh, the beginning treatment of hypertension. The data sets exist for doing this. Um, Medicare Part D is one, and the prescribing data sets that pharmacies sell uh, to pharmaceutical firms to help them guide their, uh, their uh, detailers when they go to visit individual physicians. So uh, a physician-specific cohort analysis, uh, a da the data might look like this. For Dr. A, uh, he always, almost always prescribes atenolol. For Dr. B, kind of inconsistent, but mostly ACE inhibitors. Dr. C, always ACE inhibitors, and so forth. So you can see how these data could lead to uh, individual cohorts of patients uh, and their drug, drug treatment choices. So <clears throat> nobody that I spoke to during my research for this talk uh, knew of published studies that scrutinized these data sets for individual patterns of care. Pharmaceutical companies do analyze the habits of individual physicians to prepare their drug detailers for their meetings. But as far as I know, and I've talked to several people who ought to know this literature, uh, no, nobody's done any actual published research on this topic. So we end up with some fairly weak evidence, I think, that physicians have routines, but we strongly suspect it. So going back to our original example, So my conclusions are, from your perspective as a patient, uh, the treatment you receive on your first visit to a doctor is random. Exceptions would be if the doctor uh, routinely practiced shared decision making or actually put a sign saying, you know, I always start treating hypertension with atenolol. If your doctor is a creature of habit, I'd argue that your treatment will be biased toward his preferences. Even when you know the care that you receive, even if you do know the care you're receiving, you may not know, uh, you may experience the effect of this bias uh, unless you can make an independent assessment of whether this physician is sort of a middle of road, middle of the road prescriber or somebody who operates the extremes of the uh, distribution. Thank you. Do you have any uh, 
questions for Dr. Sox? Not, of course, we'll come back at the, at the panel. Okay, yes. Just a brief comment. One of the differences, uh, one of the aspects of, of, that, of seeing that doctor, except for the one that practices patient choice, is the disclosure, which would happen in the research context, that there are alternatives. Um, so it's not just the randomness that's different in the research context, it's also the disclosure that there's alternatives. Yeah. I guess the hidden message of my talk is that the problem of usual care and lack of disclosure dwarfs the problem involved with the lack of choice when you submit yourself to randomization. Well, Um, we have, yeah, uh, would, could you just go to the mic? We have a raise to the mic. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm um, just wondering if you mean, if by routine you mean that doctors just arbitrarily do it, that their routines that they may have aren't based on anything. Well, the case of surgery. No, I'd argue basically that they're based on something. They're based on being familiar with the use of a drug, its side effects, or, or being used to doing a particular kind of surgery and do it really well. So I think there's some reasons for it. They may not be so much evidence as familiarity. Rob? Morning. I, my only comment would be I, I think it's a critical to distinguish between randomness and arbitrariness or capriciousness or biased, um, non-evidence-based decision-making. Because ra randomness really does imply a process which um, has a structure and a method, whereas what you're describing is really um, biased arbitrariness. And, you know, like a lot of others, we've studied this quite a bit, and it doesn't look like randomness. It actually looks like um, patterns, but not patterns that are based on um, evidence per se and not individualized. So I, I think that distinction, at least in my view, is very uh, important. On the other hand, Rob, when you walk up to the physician's office and you don't know what routine the physician has, for you it may seem arbitrary or Ar ra random or arbitrary. You don't know. I, I mean, I would say it is arbitrary and it seems unknown, but it's not random. <laughs> Semantic and lexical problems will long outlive us. <laughs> Last word here. Yeah, John Lantos from Kansas City. Um, uh, one of the options was shared decision making. Have you done any studies on the process of shared decision making, particularly looking at how much it looks like doctors uh, practicing in the same way they would if they claim not to be using shared decision making? Well, I, you know, I'd like to think that I practiced shared decision making before it had that name, which you know, basically means talking to your patients. There is not a lot, to my knowledge, there's not a lot of camera in the room, microphone in the room, listening going on when patients and doctors uh, try to decide on something important. Uh, one of my uh, colleagues, uh, who's now at the Cleveland Clinic, actually had access to tapes of, doc, of cardiologists talking to patients about uh, medical care versus uh, revascularization. And uh, what you heard on those would curl your hair. Awful. 